I think one of the things that has happened to the first generation of kids to grow up always being online, which by the way are my kids, they have never experienced dial up or anything like that. They've always had always on. And what I've seen is they have a, a global awareness that was not present in my generation. They really feel as if this is one world. They also feel as if they are always connected to everyone else. There is a feeling of being connected that I did not have in my generation. And I think the third thing is that there is a sense of movement forward, the sense of going somewhere, of maybe you might call it progress, that I think was not present in previous generations. Regardless of whether you think you know, social technology and the internet is good or bad. It, it is. This is what, you know, the, the, the genie is out of the bottle. And I think that's an amazing thing. The social web can do more good in the world than it can do bad. And it's the choice of people and the people who are using it as to what they want to do with it. It is the most empowering generational shift that has ever happened. The human brain, like any animal brain, is attuned to distraction. It, it, in a sense, it wants to be distracted. It wants to see what's going on in its surroundings. So, you know, it's not a, it, it doesn't miss some source of food or isn't attacked by, you know, a tiger or something. Um, and I, if you look at the way the internet bombards us with stimuli, not only hyperlinks and different pages of information, but alerts, you know, from Facebook updates to Twitter alerts to, uh, you know, incoming email and even our, our phones going off all the time. It creates, in, in a sense, an environment of information that plays to our desire to or our need to be distracted. And so it becomes very difficult to keep a focus on anything when you know, five different things are happening at once on your screen or, or, you know, between your screen and your smartphone and so forth. And, and it's, just a, it's just all sorts of environmental stimuli that come through, you know, this, this information medium and keep us pretty much permanently distracted when we're online. When you look at the fact that you can be sitting in your pajamas on your couch and help help drive, you know, world peace, that is actually happening today. That's possible in a way that it was never possible before. And I think that that's something that is incredibly important. So, you know, does it mean that people have shorter attention spans? Yes. But is that a bad thing? Maybe, depending on what your point of view is. But in terms of what it can actually enable socially, economically, and politically, I think that we should embrace and welcome social technology, uh, not fear it. You know, it's not so much that they're behaving differently as much as that we have a sense of visibility that we've never seen before. So we're used to being able to see a certain group of kids in certain places, right? The mall, we can see kids hanging out with their friends that way. But as adults, we don't typically have a really good sense of all the kids and a good sense of where they are and what they're doing when they're with their friends. What's going on online is, it, in many ways, it's youth space. Mm. So they're there, they're goofing around as though it, they're there just with their friends. Mm. And so what ends up happening is you can get a sense of what's going on really in broad sweeps. And it isn't just the kids like the kids in your community, mm. but the kids who are in different communities all around the world with all sorts of different ideas of what is normative behavior, mm -hmm. right? And that what, what is normal, what is common really differs. And so. We see these behaviors online and we're like, oh my gosh, it's radically different today than it ever was before. It's not really. Well, it's... yeah, I, I was going to ask that actually. How different is it from like when I was a kid, I'd come to the mall and I'd do stuff at the mall or I'd go to the movie theater or whatever. Right. How different is it? Think about what happens when you were doing that with your friends, right? You were there, you were joking around, you were gossiping, you were flirting, you were kind of consuming culture and consuming merchandise. But it was part of this all-encompassing all social experience. The same thing is actually happening fully online, right? So all of those everyday practices, the gossip, the flirting, the joking around, that's taking place online. And it's taking place online with the same kinds of friends that took place in the mall. Right? You met up with all the kids at school, but you also saw the kids at the neighboring school, and you're like, hey, who are you? What's that about? 
that same thing is, is where we're seeing it play out. So young people who are engaged online, they're primarily engaged with the people they already know. Their friends, their friends from school, their friends from after school activities, their friends from around the community. I do think they think differently and the real question I think is how much of that is normal human plasticity, right? We all are really good at responding to opportunities and this young generation has different opportunities than, than, than my generation had. Uh, and how much of it is actually that their brains are being wired differently because of exposure to the media environment they're being exposed to? Um, the first category is, is it's relatively easy to see examples of that. In, you know, in the States right now, because we're very good at moral panics, you know, people my age, mid-40s and up, are wringing their hands right, over what kids are doing, teens are doing on Facebook. As if we would not have done those things had Facebook existed when we were young. And so we want to project this idea, well, you know, I wasn't putting drunk pictures of myself up on Facebook. It's like, well, yeah, no one gave us the chance. But I, I remember us. I think we would have done that in a heartbeat if Facebook had been around. And so rather than, you know, sitting around complaining about how young people have it better than us, which makes us look like old fogies, we decide instead that this is a threat to civilization and must be, you know, whatever, must be addressed at once in the highest halls of power. Uh, that kind of, you know, hypocrisy and lack of self-examination is always, alas, true of, of, you know, of people my age and older. Uh, the second question, though, is much more interesting, uh, which is when you grow up expecting to be able to find information at a moment's notice, what does it do to your ability to internalize information? And, the, you know, the brain is very, very plastic, very malleable, but at a certain point, it does get wired up, and it gets wired up in a particular way. And so I look at my son, who's eight, um, and he asked me, my wife, when, when Michael Jackson passed away, my wife muttered something at the breakfast table about him being a criminal. And uh, my son later asked me, right, is that, was that true? And I said, well, you know, uh, the, the dilemma of explaining the difference between accusation and proof and so forth, we're, we're going along, along in this conversation, and I say essentially no one, no one knows, right? There, there, were, there were these questions, nothing was ever proven. And he looked at me and said, not even Wikipedia? And I realized he'd never asked a question before because he tends to be in the domain of facts. What's the fastest train, Dad? I have no idea, but Wikipedia does. What's the tallest building? I was look it up on Wikipedia. And suddenly he comes up to a question that's entirely interpretive. And, and he, clearly his worldview is a little bit shaken because he, you know, there had never been a question he couldn't, couldn't answer before. And so you wonder how much of his relationship to the factual is being shaped by the idea that you, you don't need to guess or estimate or remember if you can get your hands on a keyboard, you can find out right then. So that's, that's, you know, I, that's where I'm seeing it. You know, I think about it, I've been blogging since you know, 1997. That's a really long time at this point. And sure, you can go back and you can read all sorts of things about me as a teenager, working out all sorts of issues. <laughs> Hopefully you won't, um, but more importantly, it's, it's about constantly moving forward. And so if someone wants to engage with that level of stalking and see my teenagedom, they can, but you have to read it in the light of the whole shift. And so I think for the teenagers today, they're going to be living out their teenage lives in this very persistent, very searchable manner. But 10, 15 years from now, it's gonna be part of a longer trajectory and the people are gonna be looking at the things they're doing as 20-somethings. And sure, we look back and go, oh, that was stupid what I did when I was, you know, 14. And it was, it always was. Um, but when you have this cultural element where everybody's got this track record, it's not gonna be as shocking as it is right now for the people who are you know, learning that and figuring it out. And really, the effects of the internet, I think, are the same on adults as on younger ch kids and, and, and younger adults. And if you look at the statistics, it's people in their 20, later 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s who are online much more uh, of the time than, say, teenagers. 
Um, so, so I would hate to, to have the focus on Generation Web, you know, make it seem as though, though older people aren't affected by the internet, because I think they are. And, and I think what we see in young people, the, the distractedness, the inability to, you know, read more than two pages at a time, is probably coming to, uh, to characterize older people in, in every generation as well. Having said that, you know, I think obviously the the brain is is the human brain is malleable throughout the course of anybody's life, but it's particularly malle malleable, of course, when you're young. So if if a person is brought up looking at screens and, and, and using the web and being bombarded by information, then then the question is, will the brain circuits circuitry necessary to do things like deep reading, uh, deep thinking? Will those circuits ever even come into being? Will they be wired for that kind of thinking? Or will they be wired completely for internet type of thinking, for, for uh, taking in lots of information very, very quickly? Um, and I, I, I think that's the big fear, is that we'll, we'll end up uh, with, with a generation of people who are very good at using the net and very good at finding information and, and processing information very quickly, but don't really have any capacity for contemplativeness or for concentration uh, or for deep engagement with information. Whether you meet up or not, you definitely get to know people over Twitter or electronic communication in general. With Twitter in particular, because it's a very lightweight to share something and to read something, then it's about sharing details that you wouldn't necessarily share, but that give you insight to people, whether you know them or not. It's not just meeting new people, it's staying in touch in a very lightweight way that just isn't practical. Uh, it's not practical to you know, pick up the phone and call all of your friends that are across the country every day. But you can hear from them on Twitter every day, and it provides a real connection that you otherwise wouldn't have. It keeps you much closer, so that it's not as awkward. If you haven't talked to a friend in a month, it doesn't matter. You can pick up the phone, and you can and you can immediately be like, "So how? You know, that run it sounded like a good run you had the other day." You're immediately caught up on like the chit chat. You don't have to be like, "So how's yeah. it? Are you, st are you still married, yeah. or is that a weird subject?" Yeah, or? I think you end up talking. <laughs> you end up having more interesting conversations because. Normally, if you don't talk to someone very much, you only talk about the really big stuff. And it's like, well, I got a new job. Well, how's that? That's okay. <laughs> but it's like, hey, it sounds like you're uh, running now. Yeah. You know, whatever. I think it's going to be pretty amazing to see how the next generation um, I guess evolves, if you want to call it that, um, because of their access to, to technology, but ultimately their, their access to information. Um, I think education is being redefined. It's not necessarily about memorization. It's about uh, finding, searching for answers. Um, uh, you have an infinite amount of resources available to you um, or information available to you. And I think people or this next generation, um, I guess, are much more knowledgeable about any topic um, that you can think of that also um, sometimes people think of, of I guess, the, the dangers of people trying to trick individuals with um, deceiving them with information that's not correct, that posting rumors. And, but again, I think um, this next generation is potentially more wary or I guess conscious of that, that they are making their own decisions they understand if they're, you know, reading a post or, or you know, about to click on a link, you know, where that's going to take them. So I think everyone's now is kind of, of, of conscious of, of how, th how maybe people are trying to shape their thoughts or feelings. Um, but um, again, that's not any different than what has happened in the past. I think uh, different news organizations have different takes on, you know, just even one particular event, especially when you talk about the, you know, the political system. Um, so when you, when you pick up a newspaper or turn on the, the television you know, news program at the end of the day, um, they're trying to represent their point of view, which people would always have to kind of take with a grain of salt, I guess, if you will. But now people are, I guess, more uh, conscious of that happening across the web. Well. The web is like everybody lives in London, 
right? The web is like everybody has access to this enormous pool of people, inexhaustibly large and diverse pool of people. And as a result, you know, on Facebook, on Twitter, on MySpace, on Bebo, et cetera, et cetera, people have the experience of having thousands of friends. Right? Well, no one really has thousands of friends. It's, 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 it's either the word thousands or the word friends has to be struck out for that, for that sentence to make any sense. So it's, it's evident to everybody that the web has been this incredible amplifier of weak ties. Right? We have many, many more connections. People we knew you know, from high school or from college that we haven't seen in years, but somehow we're linked to in this way. What we don't know is what that's doing to strong ties. And there has been early research to suggest, in, in, in a way kind of alarmingly, that there really is a trade-off. You can't just amplify the number of weak ties without decreasing either the number or the depth of strong ties you have. And if that's true, that's a big change because it's nice to have people where you can say, oh, hey, I'm coming out to San Jose. You want to get together for coffee, whatever. Uh, but it's really nice to have somebody who'd loan you a kidney if you needed one. And if we're amping up the former at the expense of the latter, that's a really big change in uh, in the way human society works or can work.